So folks, good day. Uh, thanks for being here. You know, it's funny. There used to be a time when I would say good morning, good afternoon. Um, actually think about what time it is, but everything is just blurring these days. Um, and I think good day is a really nice way of getting out of thinking about what time it really is. Um, so it's really great to be here with all of you today. Um, it's, a, it's a chilly day in New Jersey. So if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to Imagine we all flew into San Diego last evening and are enjoying some nice balmy weather right about now. Uh, all right, jumping in, um, we should have a ton of time towards the end uh, of the presentation, folks, for any questions you may have. I think I should be able to get through this in 15, 20 minutes. Um, so I'd love to hear some voices and see some faces uh, once we're through this presentation. So kicking off, um, let's start with a little bit about me. I am Vasudha Swaminathan, Director of Product at Stack Overflow and I work for the Stack Overflow for Teams product suite. After my bachelor's in computer science back home in India, I started out as an engineer and developer. Um, and even to this day at my core, I still am that engineer um, and love technology, right? So why did I get into product? Turns out even as an engineer, what really got me going was the drive to create customer centric products and services that utilize technology. But there was a part of me that felt like I was missing out on a key aspect of product development. You know the part where we actually figured out what to build? Um, now, a lot's changed in the years that followed, most importantly, the transition from waterfall to agile. But back in the day, you know, when I was, when I was a developer, you would be handed this long PRD, as we would call it, product requirements document, and the dev would then spend months building to spec, a spec that probably wasn't even accurate anymore, right? Um, but most importantly, though, what I realized was I love, absolutely love speaking to customers and watching their eyes light up uh, when you've succeeded at creating something that makes their lives better. You know, special brownie points if they didn't even know they needed it, right? But clearly, I digress. We are here to talk about diversity of thought in product development. But before I jumped in, I also thought it might be helpful for folks to hear a little bit about Stack Overflow and what we do. Stack Overflow is one of the top 40 websites in the world and receives 50 million unique weekly visitors, sorry, unique monthly visitors. Our mission to help developers write the script of the future. If you ever had a technology or software question, chances are Google sent you to one of our 20 million question answer pages. Uh, just to give you an idea of scale, a new question is asked every 15 seconds. It's clear that millions of developers rely on Stack Overflow to solve their coding problems, share siloed knowledge, and ship better code faster. But in our quest to serve the world's developers, what we realized was not everything can be asked and discussed in a public setting. Enter Stack Overflow for Teams. Think Stack Overflow, but for your team, right? So we built teams and continue to build teams as a space for teammates to ask questions, share knowledge, and find answers. Teams all over the world need tools that drive collaboration and knowledge transfer in real time, probably more so than ever before now. They need instant access to information in one central location that is transparent and brings a level of trust to shared information. And this brings me to our talk today, finally, right, about time. Ease of collaboration, transparency, and knowledge sharing are the critical pillars to cultivating diversity of thought in your organization. But why do we care? First and foremost, when we say diversity of thought, it's not really about what you think. Most people assume that's what it is, right? Diversity of thought, what do you think about this idea? Instead, it's actually about how you think, and there's a big difference there. People bring different cultures, backgrounds, and personalities to the table. And those differences actually end up shaping how we think. Some are analytical thinkers, while others thrive in creative zones. Some are meticulous planners to the T, right? You need to know exactly what needs to happen when and what comes after what. And others love spontaneity. A recent study by Deloitte shows that by mixing up the types of thinkers in a workplace, companies can stimulate creativity, spur insight, and increase efficiency. There's also a side benefit here. 
diversity of thought can protect us against groupthink. What is groupthink? It's a dangerous tendency in groups to focus first on conformity, often at the expense of making good decisions. I'm sure many of us have experienced this firsthand. Driving towards consensus is not always the best way of doing things as easy and as tempting as it may seem. Now, all of this ultimately leads to better products. Now, you may ask, if everybody was not muted here, um, why are we talking about this now? Why is this even a hot topic? And I would say, great question. Today, folks, we live in a time where information is literally everywhere. We no longer have to put much thought into solving problems. Google it, as my seven-year-old says. With a few swipes and taps, I can learn about X, Y, and Z. With this abundance of information comes a new kind of challenge, quality. We didn't have this problem 30 years ago. The information that someone found in an encyclopedia or in a newspaper, books, was generally accurate. Time went into gathering sources and reference material. Facts were easy to understand. But today, we all contribute to this collective knowledge. That's huge. Think about it. We are each now responsible for how our communities, whether at work or at home, think about information simply by how we are involved and what we contribute. Let that sink in. You are a tiny piece of this knowledge ecosystem and your involvement has a profound impact on what is done with that information. All right. Let's apply this to product development. Say I'm building a new product because I had this really amazing idea. My idea is to build a knowledge base that everyone within a company can use to learn new information and share information. Very original, right? All right, so I'm really excited about this idea. I talked to a few of my friends that are also developers and they all agree that this is too good to be true. Such ideas come once in a lifetime. A bit much, I'll take it. So yay, we get to work building the knowledge base of our dreams. We think about every scenario under the sun of how it will be used and continue to build it up. Time to launch in beta and get some real people using the product. My engineering friends love it. Usage is high, adoption is strong, and feedback is overwhelmingly positive. I'm feeling pretty good about myself right about now. But now it's time to get other teams outside of product and engineering using it. And let's just say I'm no longer feeling that good. Looking back on this, it makes sense, right? I was only taking into consideration one viewpoint, the engineer. I didn't talk to say HR professionals, the finance team, marketing, sales organization, or even enough developers who aren't my friends. Without that, how would I even hope to have identified weaknesses in my idea, all the holes in it, because turns out there were many holes in there. How would I even know how to position this product? Who is my target? Who is going to buy this, use this? How do I sell it to them? If I wanted to build something that met the needs of these people, I should have included their viewpoints in the discovery and testing. I know my story is super simplistic, right? But the truth is, in spite of how obvious and glaring this example may have been, and how we all would never want to do things this way, we all fall into this trap at one point or another. This really is product development 101, but we as innovators fall prey to it all the time. Why is that? If this is so fundamental and obvious, then why do we do it? It's easy to gravitate towards information and feedback that sounds and looks like your own, especially when there aren't systems in place to ensure diverse viewpoints are collected. Oh, and that approaching deadline? That doesn't make things any easier, right? This lack of diversity of thought not only hurts things like development cycles, but also our cultures, both at work and in our personal lives. Interestingly enough, these were some very behaviors we saw within our own Stack Overflow public community that did not promote transparency and collaboration. New developers were intimidated, 
ideas were not being shared. New thoughts and questions were actually being downvoted. We took a look at our own practices at Stack Overflow over the last year and realized that we weren't doing anything to address the general lack of diverse information within our own public community. Without those diverse viewpoints and new questions being asked, we fall short, period. We needed to grow, evolve, and challenge the information that was available. And this past year has been focused at bringing in features and processes to ensure just that happens. In order to innovate, we needed new and varying perspectives. This is where folks, we as leaders need to push the envelope and foster a culture of open knowledge sharing and diversity of thought, because it's really the only way to build better products. So how do we get there, right? Easier said than done. All right, number one, take inventory. This can be challenging, but we have to be honest with ourselves about where our bias is within the organization. Whose ideas are we listening to? Why? When do we ask for feedback and inputs? Are we doing it too late or too early or not at all? Do we do that before we write a spec and start building or are we starting with a foundation of diverse information? Number two, create the ecosystem. Now this requires a little thought and lots of input from other teams. Systems need to be put in place rules need to be laid out. For example, if you want your product team to work with marketing and sales leadership before building something, there needs to be a repeatable process to make that happen. The easier the process is, the sooner it becomes muscle memory. You also need a central place, a central source of information in your company, one place that people are comfortable sharing this information. This needs to happen outside of instant messaging. As tempting as that may seem, folks, that's not gonna solve this problem, right? Internally, we actually use our own team's product for this. Every single cross-functional group uses our instance, not just engineering product. I mean, marketing, sales, legal, infosec, people team, IT, they're all in there. Questions are asked, answers are shared, one and done, right? The answerer doesn't have to repeatedly answer it for every person that has the question. The tool then just helps keep that knowledge fresh and relevant. And this information transparency, the collaborative nature of it, and the trust-based system builds for a strong culture of diversity of thought, right? Now, this is the core pillars that we spoke about just a few slides ago. All right, number three, goal it. If clear goals or a way to measure success isn't tied to this initiative, teams will have a hard time adopting, period, right? Even something as simple as saying that for every new spec, there needs to be input gathered from five sources outside the immediate team can start the ball rolling. Just that could be super helpful, right? Communicate clear benchmarks that need to be met before a project moves forward and throughout the development cycle. And then finally, promote it. Really promote it, right? Nothing gets adopted overnight, especially when you're potentially breaking years of bad habit. Constant promotion of how teams work together is how you'll change behaviors. Not just the wins, of product launch and sales metrics, which can also be product, a product of diversity in thought, by the way, but how effective the development cycle was because of this diverse thought pool. Remember, celebrate the big things along with the small. All right, I'm gonna leave you with a few more things here that's gonna probably help you along the way. As you look to grow your teams out, think about some of these things. Number one, Hire the unconventional candidate, not the one that gets the most correct answers, but the one that gets answers to the ones others do not. This is super interesting and it has really changed my life in a big way as I, as I interview more folks to join our team and speak to the different candidates. You often, you know, in the past would gravitate towards, oh, they got the answer right, right? Um, this person is it, we need them on our team. Versus if you think about that's 
that's a very different way of thinking about this. I, I never thought uh, you could solve it, you know, in, in that particular direction. Think about those things as, you look, as you're talking to these new folks, because that's, that's a difference in how they think. And that's what we mean, again, remember, by diversity in thought, how you think, not what you think, right? Number two, know your team and leverage their unique talents. Who is a creative thinker? Who is more analytical? Who is action-oriented? Align those strengths to the various phases of product development. And I, I'm already thinking your, your gears are moving in your head, right? You can imagine an action-oriented person working so beautifully towards that delivery stage of your product development life cycle versus a creative thinker is gonna be a powerhouse in the discovery uh, phases of your product development cycle, right? Number three, rephrase questions to encourage honest feedback. Don't say, so what do you think about this proposal? Instead, maybe try something like, what part of this do you least like, right? Be more specific if you wanna elicit a good feedback. And last but not least, create a culture that is open to new ideas, starting with yourself, right? Don't stifle conversations or be close-minded to suggestions, even on your own ideas. And maybe I should say, especially on your own ideas. Okay, folks, that was easy, right? I leave you today with a challenge to take that first step, remember, that we went through, take inventory of how ideas and knowledge is shared in your company. Are there gatekeepers to information? Do you rely on a small subset of people to give inputs, shape roadmaps and build products? And maybe, this is the part I love, maybe start to think about what your products would look like with new ideas and viewpoints injected into the development cycle. I guarantee you, it's gonna bring a smile to your face and delight you even as you just think about it. And with that, I'm actually done here. Thank you. Can I answer any questions for folks? This was a really great talk. Um, I think that this will be a, a must watch once we get the video posted after the event too for those folks who weren't able to attend it live. That sounds great, Ricky, thanks. Oh, there is one question. All right. How is Stack Overflow as a platform working on integrating diverse thoughts for Q&A? Um, great question, Chris. Um, so as I was alluding to earlier in the talk, uh, a lot's been happening in the last year. And a lot of it actually, because Stack Overflow is so public, right? We are default public. You do get to hear a lot of that uh, through our you know, blog posts and even just on Meta with us talking to our community. Um, like I said, a big focus has been about how do we bring in those diverse viewpoints into the mix, right? Because what we had observed is um, all of our uh, members that were talking in the community were our folks from, from the many years ago, right? And we weren't really bringing in any of those new viewpoints, um, you know, uh, folks that had recently started getting into uh, uh, technology and coding, and we needed those things on the platform if we wanted this to continue to be a place that's useful for everybody. So um, just sort of thinking about some of the things we've done, um, a big uh, part of our, um, uh, you know, mission this year has been becoming more welcoming, right? Because um, a, a, a lot of the folks that were coming in were either constantly being downvoted or were actually scared to ask because they were worried about the backlash or the reaction they would get from some of our um, you know, folks that had been around a long time. So a lot of those experience uh, updates that we did was for this um, new community of uh, users that were coming to the platform, whether it is about the asking of a question experience where we actually improved the wizard um, and provided them more guidance about how they should ask. We also had this mentorship program where we would have long-term um, users actually offer to be mentors for these new folks to guide them through how to 
uh, navigate this community? How do you frame the perfect question? How do you ensure you're not asking something that's already been answered, right? All of those things, uh, we were just getting better at giving them those tools and the support they needed to make them successful. We also added some little things that helped, like uh, this new new um, um, new contributor badge, right? Where it would literally say, "Hey, this is a new person that just joined. You know, welcome them." So you would actually see a visual indicator. So when someone would interact with the person, they would know that this is a person that has just started. So you know, um, welcome them into this into this community and and help them uh, in the process. We also did uh, another project called Comment Classifier, which actually is a bot that automatically flags comments that should be reviewed, right? And I think most folks know we have moderators um, on Stack Overflow that uh, are constantly reviewing flags, uh, but the onus is on uh, a user to flag these things. So instead, this Comment Classifier was a great way to automatically flag things that we believe um, you know, look like something that that needs to be reviewed or taken down. And that allowed our moderators an extra sort of tool uh, into taking things down that weren't as friendly um, as we would like, right? So a lot of those things um, are underway. We've updated our agreements uh, with our community and the moderators. So lots going on uh, around that uh, aspect. But again, the, the bottom line of all of this is how do we bring in that diversity in thought, not just in the products we develop, but also in the community, uh, communities using our products, especially in our case with Stack Overflow. I hope that answered your question, Chris. All right, we have one more question. Uh, what company or companies do you feel does all of this well? Ali, I'm just going to say no one, right? Like there is always room for improvement um, when it comes to diversity of thought. And I know these days inclusion and diversity is such a big topic. Like if you go to the careers page of any company, it's going to be front and center where they say, you know, we have a diversity and inclusion program. You know, we're constantly looking to hire and uh, and grow our um, our employee base to be much more diverse, right? Um, in practice and in action, it all comes down to what actually happens in there. And I mean, I, I don't know what happens in all of those companies, right? But I will say this, that every single place there is room to get better, including our own, right? And while I explained how we do things at Stack and, and how we've actually been able to leverage um, the Stack Overflow for, for, for Teams product to help make that happen, um, like I said, there is always an opportunity to make things better. What's, what's important is for this to become muscle memory for folks, right? Versus a forced, um, you know, like you're, say you're interviewing a candidate and, uh, or you're working through a product project and you're like, um, halfway through it is when you realize, oh, I didn't really show this to anyone outside my immediate team, or I didn't really share this with marketing or sales, right? When that happens, you know, something is broken, right? It's only working when these things happen organically and naturally and doesn't feel forced. It should just it should just be muscle memory, like I said. Um, all right, one more question. As someone relatively young and from, oh, I'll take that as a compliment, and from a non-technical background working in technology, how can you help hiring managers, team leaders, understand the importance of different perspectives, different thinkers to teams? This is a great question, and this is anonymous. I wish I knew who this was, but uh, anonymous at any, this is a wonderful question. Um, things are changing. Right. And um, yes, um, you know, we've come a long way. I was I was talking to you guys all about, uh, you know, from waterfall to agile and, and how far we've come. Um, this aspect of bringing in diversity of thought, as I was mentioning in the earlier question, is a very, very important and apparent topic. Like case in point, this conference, right? Inclusion and diversity is one of the main topics that's being discussed at All Things Open. And we have different speakers speaking to all of those sessions, right? So what I will say there is, um, hopefully, if you are in the right organization, this is not gonna be a new topic for you to bring up, right? But what I will say is don't, don't uh, think of yourself as someone that's young and relatively new. Don't, don't um, you know, go into the conversation with that preset um, notion, right? Go into it looking to engage with them about, about this topic. Tell them, hey, um, I would love uh, you know, to have folks 
with this kind of experience or someone who comes from this sort of a background, right? Like give them um, actual tangible skill sets or types of experiences. Like I said, again, the focus here is about the how they think, right? Which can be influenced by their culture, their background, uh, whether they're analytical versus creative. So lots of things you can do there is one, arm the person you're talking to with some of those talking points, right? That's number one. Number two, this definitely got to be some kind of an interview script or some sort of a um, you know, hiring plan, right? See if you can provide some of those inputs in there so that you can tease out some of those things. Because oftentimes those hiring plans and interview scripts haven't been touched in a long time, right? And could probably use a refresh. So you can go in and see if you want to ask questions a certain way, like maybe flip it on its on its head, right? Um, to to in, in, incite, uh, entice some of the, that response, you can actually assess if this is somebody you want to bring on to the team, right? So again, I think my main advice here is um, don't go in uh, already sort of cutting yourself short. Like you, you the, the reason you're thinking about this um, is it's important and you need to go in armed with the um, ammunition to have that conversation so you can actually get the change going, right? Um, I think I think those would be my main main points of advice for you.